So we know that homeostasis is what keeps our body healthy and functioning, right? Because the definition of homeostasis is what? Someone remind me the definition of homeostasis. So we know it's the body's ability to do what? So let's open up the chat. Keeping balance within the body. I like the, the terminology that you use. You use your own terms. That's excellent. So maintaining the stable internal environments. Going to maintain stable internal environments. Okay, and your classmate said balance, and that's a great term. Okay, so maintaining balance in the body. Okay. Now, in order to maintain homeostasis, your body has to use a mechanism called negative feedback. Negative feedback does what? It's got to do three things. So what does negative feedback involve? So what do you need to be able to maintain balance or stable internal environments? There's three parts to negative feedback. Well, you have to be able to sense the change, right? So you have to be able to detect any change that happens. Okay. Then once you detect the change, you have to do what? Do you want the change to be greater or do you want to oppose that change? Oppose it, perfect. So you're gonna to start to, your body enacts some type of mechanism that opposes the change, okay? In other words, it's going to bring you back to where you were. Okay. And then the third thing is you then target whatever you need to do, and then you, you end up with going back to where you were, returning. To, I don't like to use the term normal, so we'll say returns to um, set point. Okay. All right. So that's what negative feedback is. In order to maintain homeostasis, you have to use negative feedback. So negative feedback includes being able to detect the change, opposing the change, and then going back to where you were. Okay. All right, so an example of this is body temperature regulation. Okay, a really popular example of your body maintaining homeostasis is body temperature regulation. Maybe not this week, but a few weeks ago, it got really cold, right? So here we are, and you live in Minnesota. <laughs> That's supposed to be Minnesota, okay? So the weather outside is, let's say, negative, you know, at one point we had like negative 12 wind chill. You know, it felt like negative 12 degrees, okay? Your body 
your internal body temperature, okay, should be at what set point? What's the average body temperature set point? Exactly, 98.6 degrees, okay? So clearly there's a difference between the temperatures in the outside versus what's inside your body. So if you were outside, okay, because the temperature outside is gonna cause your core body temperature, your set point to drop. And it's gonna to drop to, well, let's say 96, 95, 94, and so on. And it could continuously drop, right? Because that's what would happen unless your body has the ability to maintain homeostasis. And since it does, what's gonna happen is that you're, you have receptors on your skin, okay? So you have skin receptors that can detect the change in temperature. Okay, and it takes that information, it sends it to your brain. And the specific area in your brain that acts like a thermostat is your hypothalamus. So your hypothalamus acts as a thermostat that goes, it's, it's kind of the deciding, right? It's gonna go, okay, my body is set at 98.6 degrees. It is now dropping due to the weather outside. Okay, so now if this is negative feedback, what will it do? Will it cause this temperature to go up or will it cause the temperature to go down? So your body temperature is dropping, right? How would it respond? Will it oppose this change or will it amplify the change? So what's your body's response if this was negative feedback? So currently it's dropping, your body temperature is dropping. So what will it do? Will it cause your body to temperature to drop even further or will it oppose it and bring you back to 98.6? It's gonna oppose it, exactly. So it's gonna oppose the dropping body temperature and it's going to activate mechanisms that cause you to increase your body temperature. And those mechanisms could be, for example, shivering. Because whenever you shiver, your muscles contract. And whenever your muscles contract, you produce heat. And when you produce heat, your body temperature is going to increase until it gets to 98.6 degrees, okay? So that's an example of negative feedback. Now, your body is not a perfect mechanism. So we know that in terms of temperature, you have a set temperature or a set point. And that set point for body temperature is 98.6. So whenever your body temperature drops, you're going to activate mechanisms that cause it to go up but you can't have it be precise, so it's gonna go up. So let's say you start to overheat. Your body temperature ends up, because you were shivering, your body temperature is gonna end up being like 99 to, to 100. Then you will activate other mechanisms that then cause your body to cool down. And essentially it fluctuates along the set point. That technically is how homeostasis works, okay? So you have a set point, and your body senses any change and opposes it so that it fluctuates along the set point. And we call this dynamic equilibrium. So on average, your body temperature is still the 98.6. Even though it's not always gonna be precise, it's gonna kind of 
activate mechanisms that push and pull until your set average point is 98.6. So that's negative feedback. You detect the change, you oppose it, and you return to your set point. Questions? Does, does that make sense in terms of homeostasis and negative feedback? Make sense, yeah? Or no? You can say no too, that it doesn't make sense. Okay, awesome. Comparing that to another body mechanism that you have, this is a normal body function that you also have, okay? So that's an and sign. Okay. The other mechanism that you have is positive feedback. Okay. Positive feedback is not a part of homeostasis. It is a regular body function but not a part of homeostasis, okay? So with positive feedback, it's going to do the opposite. So it also has to be able to detect a change. But instead of opposing that change, it's going to amplify the change. Okay. And some major differences besides what it does is that positive feedback is often considered to be life-threatening. Or dangerous. Okay. But it's something that needs to be done. Okay. So for example, oftentimes the example that's used in positive feedback is childbirth. Okay. So let's say the person is pregnant. Okay. And the baby is ready to leave. So what happens is that when what's going to cause the contractions is a hormone or a chemical called oxytocin. Okay. Now, when your body senses the release of oxytocin, it's actually going to, that message is going to be sent to the brain as well. And then you're actually going to start to produce more oxytocin. So whenever the baby's head hits the cervix, it's gonna it's gonna cause the release of oxytocin, and more and more oxytocin is gonna be released. Right? In other words, this will be what induces labor. Is labor is childbirth um, life threatening? Can you die from giving birth? Yeah, absolutely. So it meets this criteria of life-threatening, but it also meets the criteria that it needs to occur, okay? So that's one example of positive feedback is child labor. It senses a change, it senses the release of oxytocin, and then it's actually going to cause even more oxytocin to be released so that it induces labor, okay? Another common example of positive feedback is when you have a fever, okay? So fever is another example of positive feedback. Now here's the thing, what is often associated with the fever? So when you have a fever, what do we, what do we suspect that it's due to?
what is often associated with having a fever? Yes, exactly. So you've got an infection going on. So because you have the infection, your body purposefully increases the body temperature. Why? Because through time, through evolution, we know that when the body temperature gets too hot, it's actually going to cause the infection to slow down so your immune system can catch it. Okay? Is having a fever life-threatening? Absolutely. You can die from a fever, but does it need to occur? Absolutely, because you need to slow the infection down so your immune system can catch up. So in a fever, when your body senses the infection, it's going to increase body temperature and it amplifies it so the temperature will continue to increase. And that's why it's life-threatening because if you have a fever that gets out of control, you can die from that. Okay. So in this case, a fever is an example of a positive feedback because why? It's trying to reduce the infection by increasing the body temperature. And when the body temperature increases, it's just going to continuously go up and up and up. And that's why you have to carefully monitor fever so that it doesn't get too high where it starts to damage the brain. Okay, because again, fever is a pause is a part of positive feedback. It's an amplifying. So in other words, it can get too high and cause damage. Okay, so even though both positive feedback and negative feedback are part of your body's function, negative feedback helps you maintain homeostasis where positive feedback is usually associated with like a life-threatening or dangerous situation that needs to occur. Okay, so that's the major difference between those two. Questions? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, I thought I interrupted someone. So if I did, please speak up. Okay, so there was a request for chemistry and chemistry is a pretty large chapter. Is there something in chemistry specific that you'd like to talk about? Protons and electrons, okay. So we're looking at atomic structure. Okay, so when you're looking at an atom, okay, an atom has a nucleus. And like we said this morning, the nucleus of an atom is not the same as a nucleus of a cell, okay? So the nucleus of an atom contains protons, which are positively charged, and neutrons, which is indicated by a little dot. Neutrons have no charge. Okay, now because of the protons, Oftentimes, what you're going to find is that the electrons, which are negatively charged, are attracted to the protons. Okay, so you have electrons on the surface or uh, surrounding it. Okay, and when it surrounds it, it surrounds it in what's called an orbital or a shell. Okay, now there can be atoms that have like five different orbitals, okay? But that's more of a complex chemistry than we need for this class, okay? So for the purpose of this class, I'm gonna to introduce to you three orbitals. The first orbital, the second orbital, and the third orbital. The first orbital can only hold a maximum of two electrons. 
Okay. The second and third orbital can hold up to eight total, um, each one. And that's where we get what's called the 288 rule. So we have the 288 rule. In other words, the first orbital can hold up to two. Once that fills out, it has to go to the second orbital. And once it gets to the second orbital, the max of that can hold is eight. And the third orbital can hold up to eight. Okay. So let's take a look at the periodic table. Let me pull this up. Periodic table. I'm going to take a screenshot of that and I'm going to plop it. Let's take um, a few. Let's take sodium. Sodium is a fun one. Copy. Hmm, no, let me copy. Let's go to one where I can copy. Images. Uh, the image and then go back to my PowerPoint and plop it in there. Okay. So you can see that on a periodic table, you have a symbol. Okay. Then this one is not the best. So let me find um, one that has more details of this one, for example. Um, yeah, seems good. Oops. Let me just share my screen so you can see this as well. Share my full screen. Okay, so you should be able to see the periodic table. Okay, so you can see that on the periodic table, there's the symbol. So for example, H stands for the hydrogen. There's a number right there. That's the number of protons, okay? And then the there's another set of numbers on the right-hand side, and that's the atomic mass, okay? So if we were to look at sodium. What's the symbol for sodium? What's the set? Perfect, thank you. What's the number of protons? Perfect. What's the atomic mass? And let's go ahead and just round it up. Perfect. So 1123, okay. So let's change this to sodium because I like sodium better. Sodium, Na and 11 and 23. Okay, so if I'm looking at sodium, sodium would look something like this. Let me delete this. We don't need that anymore. So let's say this is sodium. Here's the nucleus of the atom, okay? If it has 11 protons, And it has a uh, atomic mass. Of 23. Okay. What's atomic mass? What's the, the formula for atomic mass? Who knows what atomic mass is? So atomic mass is equal to what? The number of protons? Perfect. Oh, that's close. Not quite. So there you go. 
So atomic mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Okay, so if I know that the atomic mass is 23, if there's 11 protons, how many neutrons is in here? Twelve. Perfect. Okay. So then from the atomic mass, and I always know the atomic mass, I always know the number of protons, which means then I can figure out the number of neutrons. Okay. So that's that. Now, it turns out that atoms start out being neutral. What does neutral mean? What does neutral mean? It means that the number of what is what to what? If it's neutral, the number of protons, which are positively charged, is equal to the number of electrons. Okay? Where do we find electrons in an atom? In the nucleus or in the orbitals? Perfect, okay? So the first orbital right here can hold up to how many again? What's the maximum my first orbital can hold? Two, which leaves me with how much I do I need to account for? So let's do some math. If there's 11 protons, okay, and if it's neutral, that means it's gotta have 11 electrons, right? Is, there you go, okay? So then that means I have to go into the second shell. Second shell can hold up to eight, which means how many electrons do I still need to account for? One, perfect. That means in the outermost shell, which is the third shell in this case, it has one electron. Two, so there's two here, there's eight here, and there's one here. So that does add up to 11. So I'm good, and I'm good here. Okay, so that's what sodium would look like. Sodium would have 11 protons and 12 neutrons in the nucleus of an atom. It would have three orbitals, and in its outermost orbital, it would have one electron. Now, the outermost orbital is always referred to as the valence electrons. So in this case, sodium has how many valence electrons? In other words, how many electrons in its outermost orbital? One, exactly. Okay. Now, we learned earlier this morning that atoms prefer to be what? Over neutral. It prefers what to be, to be what over neutral? Exactly. It prefers to be stable over being neutral. Okay, so let me ask you something. What's stable mean? What does stable mean? What does it mean to be stable? Someone said it this morning. Not quite balanced, but close. So stable means that it has the maximum number of valence electrons. Okay, stable means it has the maximum number of electrons. So let's look at sodium. It has two options. One option is that it can pick up seven electrons on the third orbital and then it would be stable. Or it can get rid of this one electron in its third orbital and move down to the second orbital and be stable. Which one do you think takes less work for sodium? To pick up 
seven more electrons or to get rid of one electron. Exactly, it's gonna get rid of one electron. As a matter of fact, sodium is an atom that tends to transfer or donate one electron. Okay, so it's going to get rid of it. When it gets rid of that one electron, it goes down then to having how many protons. Once it removes this electron, now what happens? How many protons does it have? Did it lose any protons? Exactly. So it still has 11 protons, but now how many electrons does it have? Exactly. So it used to have 11 electrons here, but now because it prefers to be stable over neutral, it got rid of one. So now it's down to 10 electrons. So now overall, Sodium is what charge, positively charged or negatively charged? Because it got rid of one electron. And remember, electrons are negatively charged. Exactly. So it, ha it's, it has a positive charge of one. And that's why oftentimes you'll see sodium written as Na+. Because it prefers to be stable over neutral. Okay. So here you have an atom that's now positively charged. So that's why we call sodium as a cation. Okay, because now it's charged and it happens to be positively charged. Okay, now chloride, okay, turns out that chloride has seven electrons on its outermost orbital. So if it's anywhere near sodium, it's going to pick up this one electron that it, it that sodium gave away so that it ends up being eight electrons in its outermost. And because it picked up an electron, it is negatively charged. And that's why sodium and salt and chloride tend to hook up with each other because their opposite charges attract. That's why you oftentimes see sodium chloride. In other words, salt. Okay. So that's atoms, that's protons, neutrons, electrons, and a little bit more information than you asked for in terms of a stable and neutral, but I think it's good, okay? All right. So the next question was to talk about, let me pull, look up our old notes. We also wanted to know about tissue function. Oh. Let's next move on to passive and active transport. I think that's a good one to go through. Okay, so when we get to the cell, okay, let's spend some time talking about passive and active transport. Okay, in one of my in-class class, uh, versions with, that I teach, I oftentimes draw on the whiteboard, you know? So here's one of the things that I, I recommend students to do, just to, and you did this in your video, right? Just to draw the cell, draw it out and then label it, okay? And this is also a cognitive map of where you combine visuals with um, text so that you can associate better, okay? But let's talk about transport. I'm going to go like this. We're going to talk about passive first. And then we're going to talk about active transport. Both of them are mechanisms in which things move in and out of a cell. Okay? They move in and out of a cell, which means that there's a membrane. There's an implication that there's a membrane, right? Um, so... It doesn't necessarily have to move in and out of the cell. It's just move it, movement throughout the body, okay? So in passive, all passive transport, okay, it will always go along a concentration gradient.
What does that mean? That it moves along the con concentration gradient where all active moves against a concentration gradient. If something is moving along a concentration gradient, it's moving from high to low concentrations. If it's moving against a concentration gradient, it's moving from low to high. In addition to that, passive does not require energy. And what's the form of cellular energy that we use? Okay, let me open up the chat. ATP, excellent. Okay, so let's talk about the different types of passive. So all kinds of passive have to agree by these two rules. One, high to low. Two, does not require ATP. All the ones in, pa in, in active have to follow these two things. One, it goes from low to high. Two, it requires energy. Okay? All right. So the different forms of passive transport, we're going to talk about simple diffusion. Okay. In simple diffusion, so let's say, um, how many of you ever made Kool-Aid? Probably not, no, not a lot of people do this anymore, but this is back in the, the 80s where Kool-Aid was really cool. How many of you have ever made Kool-Aid? Open the chat. Excellent. Yes, we no one makes Kool-Aid anymore, but we used to. So when you make Kool-Aid, so here's your cup. Here's the Kool-Aid package. Here's the granules. You pour the granules in here, right? What do you notice without even stirring, without doing anything, what happens to the granules? Without stirring, you pour a bunch of the colored Kool-Aid because you know it's artificial colored sugar. It spreads, exactly. That's simple diffusion. Without even stirring it, it goes from where it's high concentrated to where it's lowly concentrated. That is simple diffusion. Without stirring it at all, things tend to go from where it's high to low. Okay? Or another example that I like to use is perfume. If you spray a whole bunch of perfume, that's a perfume bottle, by the way. So if you spray a whole bunch of perfume bottle on you and you go into a room, eventually that perfume is going to spread from where you are to the opposite side of the room. Okay, that's simple diffusion. Okay, so simple diffusion occurs when a substance or solute goes from a high to low concentration without requiring any energy. That's the most basic definition of simple diffusion. Okay. Now, facilitate diffusion is a little different. Okay. In facilitated diffusion, now it's a little bit more complicated. So let's say there's a barrier. Okay, you still have lots of solutes on one side. So the solutes are going to want to move over from where it's high to where it's low. But you notice that the openings here are very small. So because the openings are very small, in facilitative diffusion, it still has to go from high to low, 
but it needs to use the help of a protein. So that's a, a protein gate or a, a protein channel. This protein channel is going to help move the substance from high to low. Okay, so really the only difference between simple diffusion and facilitate diffusion is in facilitate, the term facilitate, it's mean, it, it means it's helped. So it needs a protein to help it move from high to low. So this process, because it's still diffusion, it still does not require energy. It's still moving from high to low, but because it's got a membrane to worry about, and it needs help to move things across, it uses this protein right here to kind of shuttle it across, okay? So both facilitate and simple diffusion, it's a movement of solutes. From high to low with facilitated needing the help of a protein. Okay. Then you have osmosis. If you, you know, older generations may have, I did, I learned, I watched Osmosis Jones, you know. So osmosis is the movement of water. Not solutes now, but movement of water specifically. It's still moving from high to low. And it does not require any ATP. So for example, if I were to draw that out, if I put a barrier right here and poured like four mils of water in here, and I poured six mils of water here, and I remove this barrier, eventually the water is going to even out right about here until equilibrium is reached. So it's gonna go from where it's high to where it's low until equilibrium is reached. That's osmosis. It's the movement of water, still high to low, still does not require ATP. Okay. Filtration. is a movement of substances, and the substance can be water or solutes. But this one, what helps you drive filtration is through hydrostatic, or in other words, water pressure. So let me give you an example of that. If you ever make coffee, you put a filter in there, you put the grounds in there, and then you add the water. And gravity is gonna pull the water down into your cup of coffee, okay? That's filtration. The movement of that water from that filter in the top to your cup on the bottom, it's, the, it's gravity plus the water pressure that's causing that movement, okay? This is particularly important when we talk about kidney functions. This is what helps to clean the water, or clean your blood, or helps move the water along is water pressure or filtration. To clean blood. It's still movement from high to low, but it's driven by hydrostatic pressure. That's what filtration is, okay? Then with active, okay, here's the cell. You can have things move in and out of the cell, okay? And again, it's always gonna go from low to high. And it's, this form is called vascular, or Vesicle transport, because whatever substance is, is wrapped around a vesicle like through your Golgi um, producing this, and it's going to merge with the membrane, and it's either going to spit something out or it's going to cause something to go in. 
If it spits it out, it's called exocytosis. It's moving out of the cell. If it's going in, it's called endocytosis, meaning inside of the cell. Okay. Or you can have something similar to this, very similar to facilitate diffusion, where you have a protein here. But now this protein, because it has to force things from where it's low to where it's high, this protein is going to help it cross over, but it's going to require ATP. Okay, so whenever you're going against the concentration gradient, you always have to have ATP. Does that make sense? Questions? Questions? Or comments? Or if you've learned, found an easier way to learn this, share it. Okay. Then tissues, in terms of tissues, I found this really useful. Um, this is, again, something I, I drew in my class. So this is a cognitive map, another version of a cognitive map for tissues. So you can see in terms of tissues, you have four main ones. You have epithelium. Let me change the color of my pen. Okay. What do I need to know about epithelium? I need to know the characteristics. I need to know the functions. And I need to know that it's based on the number of layers and the shape. So how do I name things? First, by layers. If it only has one layer, it's always going to be referred to as simple. Okay. If it has two or more layers, I call it stratified. How do I know how many layers it has? Because tissue is not going to always be easy and like, you know, is in the correct direction that you're used to, right? So how do I know how many layers? I always look for the basement membrane which anchors down the, the cell and then the free surface right here. In other words, where it has, it does, it's the, the surface, okay? So wherever the basement membrane, that's how I know that's the bottom and whatever is the free surface, that's how I know that's the top. So from here upwards, you can see a thin cell. So what would this one be called, the first one? What would that first one be called in terms of shape? So I know it's simple, exactly. So this would be simple squamous. This next one right here, so here's the basement membrane. Here's the free surface. And its height is equal to its width, OK? And when you have the height equals to its width, this would be an example of simple what? What's the shape? Cuboidal, very good. Okay, here again is the basement membrane. Here's the free surface. This type of epithelium is oftentimes associated with cilia. Okay, and because its height is greater than its width, this one will always be what? Columnar, very good. So let's take a look at this one. So here you can see this first one right here. Here's the basement membrane. It's what holds it down. That means that this right here is the free surface. So counting upwards, is there one layer or more than one layer? more than one, so it's stratified. Complete it with the shape for me. What is it, stratified what? Very good, it's stratified squamous, okay? Here, this right here, 
is what is anchoring it down. So that's the basement membrane, where this right here is the free surface. So there's nothing in that area. Okay. So from the basement membrane to the free surface, you can see that there's several layers of cells. So that's why it's stratified. What shape would that be? Cuboidal, very good. So this would be an example of stratified cuboidal epithelium. Here, this right here, what would you call this? Basement membrane. That makes this the free surface. Okay, And you can see it has the characteristic cilia. And it's got goblet cells. And if you peel it apart, okay, they are columnar cells because they're tall. Their height is greater than the width. Okay. So this one is an exception because if you look, it looks like stratified cuboidal cells. But if you pull them apart, they're actually just one layer that have been squished together. So because of that, this one is going to be called what? Yes. But finish it, you only gave me the, the layer. What would the cell type, the cell shape be? Pseudostratified what? There you go. So with this one, you would call the pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Pseudo meaning false, stratified meaning many layers. It looks like it could be two layers, but if you were careful and pull it apart, like here versus here versus here, it really is just one layer but they were squeezed together. So technically, this is pseudostratified columnar epithelium. You also have a specialized tissue type where it starts off looking like this, but it becomes like this if it's stretched. So initially, it started off as what? Identify this shape first for me, and then identify this shape for me. What did it start off as? Yep, but give me the full name. Is it simple or is it stratified? Good. So it started off as stratified cuboidal epithelium, and when it stretched, it became what? Stratified squamous epithelium, excellent. And that's why we call this what type of tissue? Or what type of epithelium? Yeah, exactly. This would be what transitional looks like. Okay. All right. So moving on to connective. Connective is probably one of the most difficult ones. Because here's the trick to connect it. I'm, on, I'm, I'm being honest. Anything that didn't fit into epithelium, did not fit into nervous, did not fit into muscle, it got dumped into connective. And that's why connective is like a smorgasbord of different types of, of tissue. Okay? So make sure you know the characteristics of connective tissue. Know the function of connective tissue. But essentially, all connective tissue is based on what kind of cells they have what ground substance they have, and what fibers they have that identify them as a particular type, okay? So we started with a, with a general classification. You have fibrous connective tissue, you have loose connective tissue, and then you have other connective tissue. So within the fibrous connective tissue, these have a moderate amount of fibers, okay? such as areolar and reticular, okay? So in terms of areolar compared to reticular, what do you notice about, what's one main difference between areolar and reticular? 
Is it in the cell type? Is it in the ground substance or is it in the fibers? What's a major, like an observation? Exactly, fibers. So clearly reticular has a lot more fibers than areolar. Okay. And then what has even more fibers than, re than reticular would be dense. So dense would have even more fibers than reticular. So in terms of fibers, areolar has an average amount, reticular has a greater amount. The most fibrous type of connective tissue would be dense. Within dense, we have two types. We have dense regular and dense irregular. So in both dense regular and irregular, it's mostly fibers. What do you notice about the patterns of the fibers? What do you notice about the patterns of the fiber in regular versus irregular? Yeah, exactly. So regular, the, the fibers are parallel to each other. They run in the same direction. Where in irregular, the fibers run in all different types of directions. Which one do you think has stronger resistance in one direction? Regular or irregular? Which one has stronger resistance in one direction? Yeah. Which one has stronger resistance in multiple directions? Irregular, right? And that's why you have the two different types of dense because we have different functions. We need different things in different areas of the body. Yep, exactly, Amanda, okay? So that's one class of connective, the fibrous. Another class of connective is loose. This one, you can see hardly any fibers, right? Mostly cells. You can see in here that it's mostly cells, okay? Adipose has mostly cells and a, hardly any ground substance at all. Okay, these are all, all these like blobs right here. Those are called adipocytes. That's what fat looks like. That's what your hypodermis looks like because it's consistent of adipose tissue. Blood happens to be a tissue. Not a lot of people realize that, but blood is the only fluid tissue you have in the body. Okay, it has red blood cells. It has white blood cells. And in terms of ground substance, what kind of ground substance does blood have? What's the ground substance in blood? Yeah, thank you, Irene. It's plasma. Okay. Then we have others. Bone is a connective tissue and cartilage is a connective tissue. Bone is very distinctive. It looks like a cut of a tree. Okay. It looks like a cut of a tree. Okay. So in terms of cells, bones have osteocytes. In terms of ground substance, it has calcium. Phosphorus. In terms of fibers, it's got collagen. That's what makes bone distinctive. Okay? Because it has that specific type of cell, that specific type of ground substance, and that specific type of fiber. Okay? Cartilage is, is really interesting because cartilage reminds me at least of owl eyes. That's how I, I all I never get cartilage wrong because I always look for two cells that are attached to each other. That's what cartilage looks like, like owl eyes. That's how I can always identify cartilage. Okay. And then make sure you know nervous and muscular. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna briefly go through the last one. I did provide um um what I did in, in my class as well. So you can see in my class, again, I, I'm very big on cognitive maps, you know, drawing it out, labeling it, 
and just dividing it up in chunks of information. Okay, so I will provide this PowerPoint for you um, to go to um, to have to study. Okay, so I want to spend the rest of the time <clears throat> doing practice questions. Do we need to know where the different tissues are found? Yes, you do, Matt. Yep. <clears throat> so, yep, you will need to know where they're found. Yep. <clears throat> That's why in the worksheet for integumentary system, I asked you, what kind of tissue would you find in the in the epidermis? What kind of tissue would you find in the dermis? What kind of tissue would you find in the, the hypodermis? Okay. So you would say, I would find mostly the um, epidermis in the... Uh, I would find epithelial, there we go. I would find mostly epithelial in the epidermis layer. And then in the dermis layer, I would find a lot of um, areolar. I would find some reticular. And then in the hypodermis, I would find a lot of adipose. 